We're back on the No Fluff Just Stuff 2009 tour, and today I'm with uh, Stuart Holloway, and uh, Stuart has a, a new book just uh, coming out, actually it just came out, on programming closure. Stu, why don't you uh, share with us where you see the value add with closure within the JVM space? So programming closure talks about uh, sort of two different sides of the coin. When I came to programming closure, I was looking for uh, an expressive list along the lines of the things that Paul Graham has been talking about for years. And, essays and books and conferences and so forth. And Clojure certainly delivers that uh, with the added advantage of targeting the JVM. So you have the power of Lisp and access to the JVM libraries. But the second side of the story is that Clojure also has an emphasis on functional programming and mutable data structures and software transactional memory. And those things have not been uh, combined uh, in a significant language platform that has had huge traction. And I think Clojure has a good chance of becoming that language. And uh, frankly, either one of those uh, sides would be enough to make closure the language that I'm most excited about. But put those two together, and uh, I got extremely excited. And uh, we're doing a lot of uh, work uh, uh, for customers uh, in closure uh, even now. It's quite early. So tell me briefly kind of the difference then between closure and Scala. I know they occupy some of the same space, but then yet they're very different as well. So the surface distinction that people are going to use to choose between closure and Scala it's going to be around dynamic typing and static typing. People feel strongly about that, and if you like static typing, uh, Scala uh, takes the static typing as it exists in Java and vastly improves upon it. Um, if you don't want any of that static typing stuff at all, then Clojure uh, takes you in that direction, and you can add type annotations uh, as is traditional in lists if you want to do that for performance reasons. Uh, the, the more interesting difference, though, is a philosophy about how to introduce functional programming to mainstream programmers. And the closure philosophy is uh, functional all the way, uh, with the caveat that you know if functional is not useful, there are places where you can escape out and do uh, mutable state with software transaction memory. Whereas the Scala approach is a functional OO hybrid. So OO that you know is good, uh, and functional that you're learning is good, and you put them together, and it's uh, chocolate plus peanut butter. And those are pretty different perspectives uh, on how to introduce functional programming. Uh, the important thing to me is to see functional programming uh, take off. So I'm happy to see people uh, excited about either of those approaches. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Now, another topic you cover pretty extensively on the No Fluff Tour is agility. And I, I characterize your flavor of agility from a very pragmatic standpoint that you use it. It's inherently embedded within relevance and how you approach projects. Why don't you just talk about some of the maybe misnomers or mischaracterizations of agility that's taken place in this space that may have prevented companies from really looking at it as something that they need to do, they need to adopt? Well, a lot of people, when they think about agile, they dive straight into very concrete tactical practices. So we're going to do pair programming. We're going to do uh, test-driven development. We're going to do uh, continuous integration. And the tactical practices are important, and I'm supportive in the right context of all those tactical practices. But if you go back and look at the Agile Manifesto, uh, it's four items that don't talk at anywhere near that kind of detail. It talks about valuing uh, people over process uh, and valuing having a fast feedback loop uh, over having a comprehensive plan. And those things address the reality of the risk of software development. And when people stay focused on the ideas in the manifesto and applying them to their situation, instead of jumping straight to a particular off-the-shelf uh, implementation, they have a lot better chance of being successful. Agreed. And a lot can be said just about the name agility sometimes strikes fear into the heart of uh, organizations because they equate agility with, let's say, no, uh, no documentation, just a, you know, let's get it done type of approach. Can you kind of address what kind of artifacts and so forth that are a result of agile applied correctly? So sure, one of the problems with that uh, I'm not going to take an off-the-shelf uh, methodology is that as you're making it up as you go along, if you have a bunch of cowboy coders, it would be easy to produce a bunch of code and no documentation. Uh, we use uh, Mingle, which is a ThoughtWorks uh, uh, project for tracking artifacts um, at, at a granular level, uh, tracking story cards, objective acceptance criteria for user stories that are uh, meeting a particular need uh, for a stakeholder. And then up at a higher level, uh, use uh, uh, phone, meetings, conversation. Uh, sometimes use the wiki features in Mingle from a tracking perspective. But the, the important thing is not the specific tools. The important thing is that there is a, a trail through the history of a project that tells what's there and why it's there. And it represents the trade-off between uh, you know, having a lot of doc documentation that becomes stale uh, and having no documentation at all. 
the Agile projects that we've done have had better documentation uh, at the end uh, than the non-Agile projects that I've worked on. Usually they have um, a half as much documentation uh, that has a lot higher chance of being accurate uh, rather than having a huge amount of documentation, 75% uh, of which is lying to you. Right, right. Very good. Well, thank you for your time, Stuart. You can catch uh, Stuart on the 2009 No Fluff Just Stuff tour. He'll be at a stop near you soon. Thanks again, Stuart. Thanks, Jay.